ways to make capitalism perform better for people and planet. And I must say, without forgetting at the same time that we also need some profit. We will look for better regulation, but we will also look for measures to stimulate more responsible behavior. Because I sincerely believe that a more responsible capitalism will be built on better structures, but also on a better conduct. I wish you all a very fruitful day, and I turn it over to Marco. Thank you, Herman. So I'll provide a little introduction, which really has three parts. So first of all, I'll tell you slightly more about the initiative and where the summit fits into the initiative. I'll then introduce some of the themes that we'll be discussing during the day today. And then I'll uh, provide a very brief outlook to the future uh, topics we will discuss. And then I'll hand it over to Colin, who's going to broaden that even further. So uh, earlier this year, we launched, uh, oops. Okay, so earlier this year, we launched uh, this initiative with a blog, which is already active. Uh, we then, uh, a few weeks ago in Milan, launched three initiatives, uh, one on families, uh, one on responsible investment, and one on corporate purpose, which is uh, the three themes we're going to deepen initially. Uh, and today we are launching, this is the inaugural uh, summit, uh, which is intended to bring together researchers uh, with uh, business and policy makers. Now this sits alongside another initiative that we have called the Global Corporate Governance Colloquia, which brings together the top researchers in the world uh, once a year to discuss research. But that's not the purpose of the summit. The summit is really meant to bring um, research uh, to policy making and to business. So that's where it fits. Now, um, what is the uh, initiative uh, about? Well, as Herman said, um, capitalism has been extremely successful. And in fact, uh, Galbraith already in 1958 published a book called The Affluent Society, which is really quite different to the kind of subsistence economy issues that we discussed uh, about the 19th century. So in some sense, he said we'd already become very wealthy at that point in 1958. We've, of course, become much wealthier since. You know, you can argue between friends whether it's four times or 20 times in terms of material wealth. But of course, there were issues. Galbraith already pointed out inequality in 1958. But of course, um, this has become even worse uh, today. And I only have to show you uh, the front page of a book and that's been a bestseller uh, to uh, make that point. Now, in addition, we also learned that there's something about this wealth creation which holds an uncomfortable truth, which is it has been built on cheap addiction and actually an addiction to cheap fossil fuels. And the uncomfortable truth is that that poses uh, a very serious problem. Now, um, the other thing that we've learned recently is that if you take total CO2 in the atmosphere today, uh, this has actually been um, produced by a very few companies, and I'll show you that uh, in a second. But how does all of that fit with our theme called responsible capitalism? So how does responsible capitalism fit with what Herman and I have said? Is that the right word? And when I first took this idea to him and he said, well, you know, how would you define um, irresponsible capitalism? And I thought that was a very good question. So maybe we shouldn't define responsible capitalism, but define irresponsible capitalism. So what, what do we mean by that? Well, as Patrick pointed out to me, Oliver Williamson actually did this by defining opportunism. And he said, it's the pursuit of self-interest with guile. Okay, now that's not very precise, so let's try because ECGI has lawyers um, and economists, so let's try and define this a bit more precisely. So irresponsible capitalism means economic actors selling goods and services that cause harm for people and the planet in the pursuit of profit or power. So that's maybe a too simplistic definition, but that's the definition I'll try to illustrate um, this morning. 
So coming back to other corporations, well, they've been very successful in um, uh, oil uh, and fossil fuel exploration and production, but it was been 90 companies that have produced uh, two-thirds of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere today. Now, you could call that a great industrial success, but as we know, it's actually a problem. Now, the question then arises, though, was that irresponsible? Was it irresponsible what these companies did? And, you know, to judge that, this is, by the way, a list which I'll show you again later. So, to answer that question, you kind of have to ask, when does something become irresponsible? And surely, it becomes irresponsible when you know that you are actually causing harm to people and the planet, because if that's what you do, you should probably stop what you're doing. So we can ask the question, when did they actually know? And we can argue about that between friends. So 1988 was the Toronto Conference, the Kyoto Protocol was 1997, but I'd argue with you that it was actually in 2008 that we really knew what this meant, because Hansen, uh, writing from NASA, told us about 350 ppm and the disastrous consequences uh, it would have if we go beyond 350 ppm. Now, at that time, we were already at 380 ppm, so um, a bit late, but then other people said, well, you know, let's just calculate how much CO2 we can still put in the atmosphere, not to stay within 1.5 degrees, but 2 degrees, and that's the famous carbon budget. So how much budget do we have in terms of carbon? How much carbon can we still put into the air? And that's a very good way of framing it. And then, of course, Carbon Tracker in the UK, they then reframed this again and said, how much unburnable carbon is there, actually? So how much of the carbon that we already know about is unburnable? And then they mapped that with listed companies in the world. And it actually turns out that basically listed companies in the world that control those carbon reserves should stop what they're doing. Not only should they stop new exploration, but they should stop digging what they already know out of the ground. And that's, of course, um, what today a lot of the activity that you see on all fronts is based on. Um, and that is considered actually responsible. If you know that you're destroying the planet, um, you should probably stop what you're doing. Now, um, activists have summarized this very neatly. Um, it's warming, it's us, we are sure, it's bad. And then they, um, because the activists very optimistically conclude, um, we can fix it. Uh, now, um, maybe we should ask, can we fix it? And what do we need to do to fix it? And that's what the morning is going to be about. It's not about everything, how we can fix it, but it's about one way in which finance might be able to contribute uh, to fixing it. So that's the first theme of today in the morning. And then we turn in the afternoon with Oliver, we turn Oliver Hart, we turn to uh, Milton Friedman. And the first time I heard this quote was from Oliver in 2016, before he won the Nobel Prize, just a few months before, when he presented a paper that he had called the, with uh, Luigi Zingales, which uses this quote by Friedman about the corporation as the launching pad. And I'll just, many of you know it, but it, it can no, never do any harm to read it again. So Friedman said, a corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business, uh, it is the responsibility of the executives to conduct the business in accordance with the owner's desires, which generally will be to make as much money as possible.
thing about, to note about Coca-Cola is that there is a uh, yearly uh, rank list, a sort of like champions of the world list, of who produces the most plastic bottles in the world. And Coca-Cola ranks number one regularly on this list, and the number of plastic bottles and the amount of plastic it produces is just astonishing. And it's also good to look. Uh, there's PepsiCo, Unilever, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Mondelez, Philips, uh, Philip uh, Morris, uh, Danone, Mars, so not exactly unknown brands. They all have a big plastic problem. Uh, now, does Coca-Cola know about this? Yes, they do. They're committed to reducing uh, plastic. Now, they had another shareholder proposal, which was filed in 2021 by, as you saw, uh, saying they should reduce the um, use of plastic bottles. Uh, and that proxy, that um, proposal actually never made it to the proxy statement. Why not? Because they actually came to an agreement before and they withdrew the shareholder proposal. So you'll never see this on the proxy statement because there was a kind of settlement. Now, what was the victory of, as you saw, um, a responsible investor uh, with Coca-Cola? Well, they got Coca-Cola to commit to reduce their mountain of plastic bottles by 25% by 2030. Okay? So that still means that you know, there's still a mountain of plastic bottles every year until that date. Um, now, what does that mean in terms of share prices? Well, we can also argue again between friends what it would do to Coca-Cola or what this does to Coca-Cola, but if Coca-Cola decided to be responsible by next year and just remove plastic bottles and take the sugar out of their Coca-Cola products, we can probably assume that that would not be good um, for their share price. Now imagine a board or a CEO would come along and try to do that. Well, then you get something else that Oliver and Luigi pointed out in their paper, uh, which is you get the market for corporate control uh, that gets in the way. Now, Oliver wrote a very famous paper called, uh, but with, uh, with Gene Grossman, about free riding and hostile takeovers. He was really too pessimistic about um, the market for corporate control because today this operates through activist shareholders. And I'm talking about hedge funds activists. So if you are a socially responsible CEO and you want to do things that might not be perfect for the share price, it's better to be really protected against activist shareholders. Now, this was the case with Unilever before 2020. They had a UK, um, uh, UK Dutch uh, structure that basically allowed the board to have the sole right to nominate candidates for election to the board. So this is a bit like, well, I'm not going to make any political analogies, um, but this is a ruling party being able to put forward only one candidate, and if you don't like that candidate, they say, well, too bad. Here's another candidate that we put forward, and this is going to be the, uh, not the, the, the CEO okay, or the chairman of the board. Okay? So that was the arrangement that was in place. Um, now, today, uh, Unilever is completely open, one share, one vote, UK PLC. It's open to shareholder activism in the way that other UK PLCs are. So uh, the CEO who did this was the previous CEO. And why did he do this? Well, he said, I need currency to make corporate acquisitions because Unilever is such a responsible company. Um, and then he also said to the Financial Times, and I'll just read it to you, uh, his goal was, his bigger goal was to prove incontrovertibly that sustainable business does drive superior financial performance. Okay, um, Nelson Peltz came along and he, had to de he will depart by the end of the year. Okay. So um, we can, of course, uh, argue about this, but this is just an illustration. So we also need to discuss about the market for corporate control. And one uncomfortable consequence of this might be that if you want to protect responsibility, uh, you might have to put in takeover protections. But if you do that, you then run into all sorts of other problems. Uh, so there's a debate to be had here. Now, the other topic that I mentioned that we want to address is the role of families. Now, why does that matter? Well, um, it could just be, first of all, most companies in the world are controlled by families. And it could also be that families actually are more responsible 
uh, than other people. They have reputations to defend uh, and all these kind of things. And also, we know that families, um, when, they, uh, when they're in control, they can just tell the company to behave responsible. So if you're a controlling shareholder, if you're a family controlling Coca-Cola, you can just say, well, stop selling things in plastic bottles containing all this sugar. And you can do that between today and tomorrow. Now, family companies, however, uh, don't all have a great reputation. So this is a or, well, great reputation, maybe, but some of them do controversial things. So this is an example from an Australian campaign, which is trying to stop the Adani Group from actually expanding its mining operations in Australia. And if they go ahead with the current plans, uh, they will, and this is an estimate from an independent consultancy in Berlin, uh, they will be producing 5.5% of the global CO2 emissions by um, 2030. Now, surely, given what I said before, that's not really responsible. The family could stop this. They're one of the richest families in India. Um, will they do that? Will they behave responsibly? How much will this cost them? Um, what are the kind of forces that might you know, get them to uh, behave responsible, but responsibly? Now, my final point has to do with the role of the state. Remember that Friedman said, uh, maximize profits within the rules set by law and ethics. So let's not talk about the ethics part, but let's talk about the law. And of course, the state comes in here then in two ways. One, um, in terms of regulation and making the laws. Uh, and then secondly, the state can actually be an actor. Now, the first point uh, is, of course, uh, associated, or the first problem is associated very much with George Stigler um, from Chicago, who coined the term regulatory capture. So this is companies influencing what the regulator does. And you know, Oliver will probably agree that Luigi Zingales is very, who heads the Stigler Center, um, he's, he's very, he very much emphasizes this point. Um, so it's an important point. Now, let me give you an example of both points. So the first one, again, comes from, I'm sorry to labor, the example comes from Coca-Cola, because they had a second shareholder proposal, which proposed for Coca-Cola to produce another report uh, related to its lobbying activities outside the United States, uh, especially in Brazil and Mexico. And the proxy statement alleges, I'm not saying they did this, but it alleges that they spent money uh, in Mexico uh, and Brazil to influence, you can imagine what, regulation on plastics and on sugar, okay, which, which is what you might want to do. Now, um, Coca-Cola's response was that they are already publishing a lot uh, what the, the, their contacts with government and their spending and, you know, any money they might spend on political campaigns and all these kind of things. Uh, and then, again, the shareholders actually sided with the board and only 12 or 13 percent voted with the board, but note it was 13%. And again, you can read the proxy statement, both the allegations by the shareholder um, activists and the response of the board are very informative. Now, that leads me to my final point, which brings me back to the original slide of these 90 companies that have produced two thirds of the CO2 in the atmosphere today. The chart actually contains yellow, uh, orange bars, and blue bars. And blue bars stay, stand for majority state control. And of course, the top company um, that's produced 3% of CO2 emissions between 1880 and 2010, but also between 1980 and 2010, so very consistently, is of course Saudi Aramco. And they need no introduction. And um, the country needs no introduction. And um, I just want to finish with this slide. Um, some people in the world haven't yet received the memo. OK, so that um, concludes my introduction so far. And let's uh, turn to um, the policy world. And uh, i just uh, like to highlight the OECD uh, draft revision of the corporate governance principles that's ongoing. Uh, and we will have a final panel with Carmen Edinoia, who is responsible for rewriting the principles. And if you look at the consultation, uh, what the OECD has, has done, it's not only put all the things that I've just talked about, which is mostly about shareholders, but also the things that Colin is going to talk about, uh, broadening the view to stakeholders, 
They've all put that into a new chapter on sustainability and reliance, uh, resilience, so sustainability and resilience. Now, that is a very tough chapter. Uh, you can see how they struggled with this chapter. And the blog feature just, um, the, the EC, new ECGI blog, um, just featured a piece by Guido Ferrarini where he asks the question, who wrote chapter six? And I leave you <laughs> to, first of all, read his blog entry, which is very interesting. Uh, and also, maybe if you stay until the end, Carmen de Noia will reveal to us what the answer to the question is. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, so let's hope that we don't see Marco drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola today. <laughs> now, let, 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 let's start off by uh, seeing if there are any questions uh, that you'd like to ask of Marco before we go any further. Would anyone like to come in and raise any points for Marco? Yeah. Uh, can, you, can, can, can you just say who you are when you... Thanks, and that was uh, very interesting. Uh, one question I had, uh, and I'm John Zitnick, I'm a professor at Georgetown Law School. Uh, a question I had, you know, you were very focused on supply side, you know, the, the, the people who are um, uh, producing um, the plastic bottles, the people who are, uh, you know, drilling the oil. And uh, I'm wondering, um, uh, I mean, I guess the thing about supply is it's one half of the equation, there's also the demand side. And uh, what I'm wondering is how much uh, role do the suppliers have here? Can, you know, if suppliers shut down, uh, will other suppliers uh, rise up in their place as long as there's demand? So uh, what role does demand play and what can we do about that? Okay, so let me try and make the point a bit more generally going back to the definition. I think whenever you have a product or an industry whereby uh, because of evolution, genetics uh, or whatever, uh, we like things that are actually not good for us. There is a temptation that people will try to sell us too much of it in the pursuit of profit or power, although they know it's bad for us. And if you think how many, to, how many industries that applies, it's a lot. And the other problem, which I haven't emphasized is enough, the link with inequality. You, for example, had in the FT uh, story this morning that they continue now that actually a different party might win in Brazil, there is just a logging frenzy. And the justification is that it has to alleviate poverty in the areas where the logging takes place. So taking these things we are addicted to away from us uh, is also not popular. Uh, and sometimes it's, not, it's very difficult. And we see that what's going on with the fossil fuels at the moment. We are addicted to it. So taking this away from addicts whether it's sugar or whether it's, you know, have your two Mars bars for the price of one or whatever it is, uh, is very difficult. So I'm not saying that these companies are not satisfying a demand, but that's where it comes to the question of responsibility. You know, although you know that people want this, are you going to sell them something which you know is bad for them? That's really the question this responsible capitalism thing boils down to, I think. But this is one definition that I've, I'm advocating here, and you can surely have others. Uh, thank you. Chris Peters from the European Investment uh, Bank. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, introduction. Uh, my question was, uh, at European level, we are very active in the taxonomy uh, issue. Uh, with all these uh, six pillars, uh, two pillars are already uh, fixed, the others uh, will come very soon. Is the relationship between responsible capitalism and this uh, taxonomy issue, and what are you thinking can or must be uh, the, 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 the impact uh, on, on capitalism when you talk about this taxonomy issue? Well, if you go back to the... Um, so first of all, I think that's uh, what we will discuss with Saha and, you know, uh, and Patrick and Hans de Kuiper and partner in the first session. Uh, but it goes back to the question of can we fix it and how can we fix it? And I think the European Commission has taken one particular view, which is to steer investment flows in a different direction than they flow today. 
Now, I think whether that's successful or not, that's precisely one of the policy questions that we want to debate. And other countries and other people have other solutions, and they're not happy with the taxonomy. And I think you'll hear another policy proposal from Patrick, um, which, which is slightly different. So that's precisely why, to, to answer or to tackle this kind of question, that's precisely why we're launching the summit uh, series and the project today. Any other questions that anyone would like to raise at this point? Uh, okay, uh, let me then put this. Uh, Good morning, sorry. Is there one there? Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry, right, please go ahead. Hi, Elena Dom, Sustainability Service at Ensure. <clears throat> and my question is about the responsible capitalism. Right now, what companies are producing, society is responsible for end of life of it. So if you buy a phone, it's the society that is responsible for utilizing it afterwards, recycling or throwing it away. What do you think of the idea if we could make companies responsible for the end of life of those products? Because then they would not pile those phones at the end of their backyard, they would design them for circularity. Well, the issue of pricing and you know, internalizing externalities and so forth, this is of course also a big part of this debate. Um, I didn't touch upon this and I don't want to touch upon it now because I think it goes a bit beyond uh, the scope of what we want to discuss today, but it's certainly a very important topic. Okay, any other questions? So let me then put what Marco's just been saying in the context of this research program that we are launching at this summit on responsible capitalism. And as Herman and Marco both said, there are three themes or three pillars, as we describe them, of the uh, program. The, the first one is about responsible investment. That is to say, the role of institutional investors, asset owners, asset managers, the relationship between the two, and their role in terms of stewarding the companies in which they invest, and stewarding them in a sense which is obviously about their commercial performance and their profitability, but also addresses many of the issues that we've just heard about in terms of social, human, and environmental issues. And to give you an illustration of the fact that this first topic is one that raises many interesting and challenging questions. Let me just quote one set of, I think, interesting observations. As you'll be aware, there are some remarkably large asset management firms, such as Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, all of which own getting on for, manage getting on for $10 trillion dollars of assets under management. Now, if you pose the question, well, who is the largest shareholder of BlackRock? The answer is Vanguard, with more than 50% 50, 50 larger share than the next largest shareholder. And if you pose the question, well, who's the largest shareholder in State Street, the answer is Vanguard, with more than 50% of the larger share than that of the next largest shareholder. So we might worry about what is termed common ownership of ownership of companies by investors, but we've also clearly got an interesting issue that arises in terms of the ownership of the asset management firms themselves. The second pillar of the program is on ownership, of family ownership in particular. And we all know how families like to describe themselves as being long-term owners, intergenerational owners, 
because of succession of ownership within the families and that they have a particular interest in looking after their communities and their employees. Well, there's been a very large study of the relationship between ownership and the performance of companies, not in terms of their financial performance, but in terms of their ESG performance, by a number of my colleagues at uh, the Sci Business School in Oxford. And they find, looking at a variety of different measures of ESG, that family control firms, and I'm talking here about listed companies, the largest companies in the world that have dominant family owners, that those family-dominated listed companies have a significantly worse ESG performance than listed other listed companies, in particular institutionally owned listed companies. And what the study also finds is that the ownership pattern that's associated with the best ESG performance is where there is significant shareholding in the hands of management. Now that raises, I think you'll agree, some quite interesting questions. First of all, along the lines of what Marco was just describing as being the rather mixed performance of family owners, there's a question about whether family ownership really is a driver of superior performance in terms of the issues that we are discussing in relation to responsible capitalism. And that comes on to the third element when one thinks about the role of management, and that is the purpose of companies, namely the reason why business exists, its reason for being, why it's created. And that comes back to that Milton Friedman statement that Marco was referring to just now. But the, the issue of what is the purpose and how that purpose should be implemented and can it be credibly implemented in a way that lends conviction to companies actually addressing the types of issues that we're talking about, gets to the heart of what ECGI is all about, and that is the governance of companies. Now, to give you one interesting observation on this, there's one set of companies that do seem to perform very well in relation to both their commercial and financial performance and their broader social and environmental performance. And that is companies in Denmark that are owned by foundations. That is to say, they are owned by owners whose objective is a philanthropic one. And in many respects, one might think, well, this might give rise to some of the worst forms of corporate performance. There is a set of owners that are essentially self-appointed overseeing the running of some large companies such as Maersk and Novo Nordisk, and yet apparently doing so in a form that is both commercially successful and responsible in the terms we're discussing today. So I think that what the Responsible Capitalism Programme is seeking to do under these three pillars really gets to the heart of the issues that we're going to have to address over the coming decade in terms of the reforms that are going to be needed to really deliver the types of outcomes that are needed, as described in Marco's presentation. And I very much hope that over the coming years, as we develop these programs and pillars, that you'll want to become engaged in these activities, because it's something that's going to need the support of everyone, as academics, 
practitioners and policymakers if we're going to make real headway on it. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for attending the start of this summit. Thank you.